Welcome to Worlds Online, the Internet's first 3D virtual world platform in continuous service since 1994. Worlds Chat was released to the public in 1995 by Worlds Inc. Later in 1997, it would be acquired by Worlds Acquisition Corporation and have its name changed to the one you've likely heard it go by, Worlds.com. Worlds.com was the first ever 3D virtual chat room. It was a pioneer for many of the others that would follow, including Active Worlds. It had avatars that you could control, had chat rooms where you could talk to others, and even included whole worlds to explore. Worlds.com has gained a bit of a reputation online in recent years. This mainly stems from a rumor. A rumor that there's a real cult that exists within the servers of the game. It was covered by many a YouTuber, a few blogs, and even a few news sites. It's something that I'll get into later, but for now let's take a look at the history of Worlds.com. Worlds.com went into beta in 1994 still going by Worlds Chat at the time, and has everyone inhabiting a space station where they are free to explore and interact with others. The space station was created by Jeff Robinson, while the avatars of promotional photography were created by Helen Cho. Together they made the original look of Worlds.com. When the game was ready to come out of beta, the team behind the virtual chat room did something interesting. In 1996, the game was scheduled to come out of beta, and a patch changed the design of the space station. It was made to look like an end of the world party had taken place. Many of the avatars had the end painted in red on their chests, while the phrase it's over was painted on the walls. There was even a global chat message announcing the impending doom. The space station was approaching a red planet, which it eventually would crash into. This event then led to the release of the full game, World's Chat 1.0 demo version and gold version. The demo version wouldn't let you leave the space station and only allowed you to use a small selection of avatars. The gold version, which you had to pay $32.95 USD for back in 1996, gave you access to everything. There's more to the history of the game, but I think we can cover that later. Let's take a look at what the virtual chat room is like, as it's still online today. Worlds.com can be downloaded directly from their website, which looks like it hasn't been visually updated since the 90s. That's because two versions of their site exist. There's a clean modern site and the original 90s version. Both are still up, but it's harder to find the latter. You have the download, which is pretty small, a screenshot of the world, and some avatars you could choose from. These include a real person, penguin, monster, kangaroo, or a clown. Below that, you'll find screenshots of some of the worlds that we'll be exploring today. These are some of the most interesting worlds and created directly by the company behind the game, as well as featured partners. I would like to also mention that I won't be exploring user-generated worlds just yet maybe in a follow-up video, as there are hundreds of unique worlds to explore, some that require you to download assets not found in the game. At the bottom of the page is a section about the basic features of the chat room. This includes avatars, text chat and mute, discussion groups, music, and more. These are all necessities for virtual chat rooms, really, but since this is the original, it would make sense that they would all be included here. Once the game is downloaded and an account has been made, you'll be sent to the first area of the game, this is the space station, which has now landed in a desert. It's known as GZ or Ground Zero, a starting point for every player's exploration. The first thing you'll likely notice is the textures of the world. This is considered 3D, but only barely. The avatars mostly look like 2D models that imitate 3D. The penguin is what you'll be started out as, but the avatar gallery is right there. There are also fully 3D models, but you have to switch to one of those avatars in the gallery. The avatar gallery allows you to swap out your avatar, as well as customize any that you select. The customization is something I didn't really get the chance to mess around with too much. I ruined the first character I was playing as and decided to swap to another. I picked the punk avatar and was off to explore whatever this game had to offer. The first thing that I need to mention is how this game works with exploring and downloading new areas. In order for you to explore an area, you have to download its assets. To do that, you must go to the area. Once there, you'll be prompted to download the assets to access it then it restarts your game. You have to do this for every single area in the game, which takes forever, so as a recommendation, you should visit every area that needs a download. Download it, and then keep playing until you've accumulated every download. Then restart and watch them all update your game. This will save you some time in the long run. The first area I went to explore was World Center. This is supposed to be a hub where communities can meet up and it's part of Ground Zero. It's presented as the space station from before, complete with sliding doors and mechanized sounds to match. 
They have sports, movies, music, and the news as hubs you can explore and chat with others. Though most of the time you'll be exploring by yourself, as I didn't run into a single person on my exploration. Continuing down this train of thought, it's eerie how empty everything is. This is supposed to be a chat service where you can and are supposed to interact with others. With no one here, it all felt kind of liminal. Like people could be moving around these empty halls and talking to each other, but instead it's just me. Every room where you could expect to find something was just a blank space with a poster or sign telling you what the room is used for. I went to every room and only the newsroom had something written on the wall. I thought maybe it could actually be current news, but it didn't seem that way. The comedy, drama, and music video rooms were all empty too. Each one had its own wallpaper and floor tiles, but nothing of substance really. Next, I checked out the sadness and glee pods. These were some of the original chat rooms when worlds.com was still in beta. I chose to teleport there, but it's important to note that you can actually just walk anywhere on this world. Everything is supposed to be connected. I walked through this weird smiley face door and was in the glee pod. Stopping at the sign, I thought that there were several rooms to hang out in. These included sunshine, chills, thrills, rave, and googie. For some reason, the doors to these rooms were wooden doors that didn't match the spaceship design. There's also really creepy smiley faces that litter the walls and floors. Definitely remnants of the old internet. As I explored the rooms, which all looked strange, I was accosted by this song that was playing in loop in the background. When I entered a different room, the song would change to match it, or match it as best it could. Some of the songs matched their rooms better than others. The low quality of the sound bites really threw me off. It was even worse with the lack of sound for everything else. No footsteps or other sound effects and just music made it all a little uncanny, especially the chills room that had a giant mirror and childlike drawings of leaves all over the walls. Another important thing to note here is that the world would stop for a few seconds as you load into a new area. Sometimes it takes only a second and sometimes you are sitting for a minute or two. This seems to happen more often when the world is loading a new song or sound effect to loop. It seems to care less about what is actually occupying the world though. The next stop was the garden pod, which has a teleporter on the spaceship. The sounds of space and some light drumming can be heard as I make my way towards the portal. Once inside, there's a sudden shift to this soft piano and the sounds of the woods. It's actually kind of nice. Well, at least at first. The more I explored the garden, the more surreal everything got. There were the sounds of birds and nature, but all I could see were blurry backgrounds and 2D images that created narrow paths to walk down. It was like existing in someone's rendition of the classic internet, where everything was representational but not actual. I got to the night side of the gardens, as the audio changed to represent a more somber time. The piano had a droning sound accompanying it, and crickets could be heard. This was supposed to be a dark area, but the sun appeared to still be up. The garden was supposed to be peaceful, but something about its design and lack of life made it more eerie. I wanted to keep exploring the area, but it kept making me load the worlds as I explored every few steps, which was getting annoying. So I checked out a few of the houses along the way back and noted nothing substantial inside. I'm not even sure what these houses were used for, as they seemed so secluded from the rest of the garden area. I suppose they were actually chat room areas in the game, but they feel so separate from the actual experience of the garden. The next area is one that I was worried about. The music pod, which could have loads of copyrighted music in it, which would make it a chore to explore, as I think having the sounds of the game really submerges you all in this world with me. Regardless, I made my way there. Upon entering, you are greeted by this NPC that uses a very awkward sounding voice clip to invite you in. I'll just play it here. Hi, welcome to Hang. Step right through these doors to see what's happening today in the music scene. Hang was the name for the areas where people were expected to hang out. The music in that area before you enter is kind of somber and I actually enjoyed it a bit. It was simple but really made the whole experience feel like I was actually doing some urban exploring. Inside the main lounge were two different doors leading to different genres of music. Classic rock, metal, country, hip hop, and so on. I decided to check out the alternative room first. Another NPC invited me in and it was pretty underwhelming. Just a blinking image in the background with some band logos on it. Next was the classic rock room, which had more blinking artist names and this weird dude that waved me in. Country was my next stop. As expected, you walk through barn doors to enter the room. It's a ranch style area and what's that on the ground? 
The music has stopped in the room, where it hadn't in the others. That looks like a dead body. I can't interact with the gate to open it and see, but he isn't moving at all. Why did the music stop in this room only? This NPC over here waves at me as if she isn't standing near a dead body. Is he dead? I know this game has easter eggs hidden in some of the worlds, but a dead body in the field of a country music hangout? I'm not sure and I can't find anyone online talking about this either. For now, I'll leave this area. I'll come back once I find answers. Next up is the metal hangout and I'll just show you what this one has to offer. Firstly, you see the fire at the other end of a weirdly shaped door. Once in the hall, you'll be greeted by this grim reaper jester along with skulls and a pentagram on the ceiling. If you walk through the fire, you'll end up in what I can only describe as hell. It's four walls with fire on each side. Again, there's no music here. Just the imagery of fire and brimstone. Honestly, very metal. As you leave the area, you get this really cool image of the place. There's an animated skull staring you down as you make your way towards the door. This image is one that I often think of when trying to encapsulate my feelings for this game. Eerie, creepy maybe, but never downright scary. This image invokes a bit of that. I'll make my way through for now. There's not much more to talk about here really except for maybe the hip hop room. On the other side of this hub, you'll find the hip hop hangout. Once inside, you're greeted with this grainy image of the Twin Towers. This is the second one of these virtual worlds that I've explored that had imagery of the towers, though this one doesn't appear to be a memorial they were just set up to be the background image for the hub, truly showing how this is a time capsule of a game. The Funland world was next and it was pretty lackluster honestly. All that I could find was this little path to 3D balloons that float up into the air. This music is playing on loop the entire time as well. Also explored the other hangouts, specifically for couples. They had one for marriage, teens, newly single, and a birthday room, complete with pin the tail on the donkey, and these creepy clowns both of which were blinking far too much. The final spot on the space station that I checked out was this odd room that seemed like it might be for piloting the ship. I wasn't able to proceed past because there's a force field created by these floating things in the sky. This noise started that wouldn't stop until I completely reset my game, which I also couldn't normally close out of, forcing me to end the process. I decided I was done with the main hub and wanted to see some of the worlds that had been created for us to explore. There was one that I saw recommended a lot, and that was the Animal House world. The world was part of a collaboration between Worlds Inc., Universal, and Hyundai. It was based off of the 1978 film of the same name and was designed as a hangout spot for college students. The actual area is probably one of the creepier in the game. When you load in, you're placed in the front yard but not by the entrance for some reason. Instead you are placed at an angle from the house, almost like you just topped the fence for some reason, maybe trying to break in or maybe running from something. The music in the front yard is the similar tune that we've heard a few times, but if you make your way to the backyard, it changes. It's all of a sudden a creepier tune. I'll let the music play for a bit to really let it settle in. There's a trend that's really popular right now in the indie horror scene, the PS1 style horror game. Essentially, a game will take inspiration from an 80s or 90s property and use PS1 style graphics and gameplay. This trend has been done many times by Puppet Combo, who make great games. This song, this town, this house, all of this together really makes it feel like being trapped in a pixelated 80s slasher film. Everything about this screams horror game. The light in the window flicking off and on, the music having that subtle drone in the background and even the pace of the song. Nothing works more though than the actual graphics of the environment. It's also blocky and digitized, but real in a way. Let's actually go inside the house. Once inside, it's a different vibe entirely. This is more of a party place. There's a bar, a TV that is playing some flashing images, which feels like it came straight from an analog horror ARG, and there are beer bottles everywhere. The world here still screams horror to me, but it's a little more subtle. The entire upstairs has inaccessible doors, except for the one that leads to the attic. There's nothing of note in the attic, but I do want to mention the lack of music that plays when you are exploring upstairs. The game goes deathly silent, which only lasts until you go back downstairs. 
There's also a basement, which we saw for a second earlier. Going down into the basement gives you a unique song. This one sounds like an 80s slasher theme and it only plays in this part of the basement. The song that plays in the backyard sounds similar, but they are each unique. There's actually more to this basement. If you go around this corner, then you'll be met with this. There are these dark hallways made of mud and a fleshy looking substance. It's hard to accurately describe the walls. They could be rock or they could be the bodies of those that were killed here and used to line the walls. The texture looks more red than I expect dirt to be. There's a new song that plays here as well. And if the horror aesthetic of this world wasn't already settling in, this should seal it. Everything about this area is purposefully supposed to unsettle you. The eerie music, the maze of flesh, colored cave walls, and the lack of knowing where you are. These walls are a maze that you'll have to find your way out of. There are multiple exits that you are supposed to find while exploring the caves. The first one I found was this giant open cavern. It was this gaping maw that definitely couldn't fit under this house. It was reminiscent of the book House of Leaves, where a large structure existed inside the confines of a house that couldn't hold it. Yet, here it was. I could also compare it to the back rooms, but I feel that comparison could be made for the entirety of the game. I kind of stared in awe of the place. I felt so out of place in the overall world of Animal House. Was this supposed to be a secret horror meetup place? Or perhaps was later turned into this by some updates? Between this area and an official map and the dead body that I saw in the country area, there was definitely more going on than meets the eye. Regardless, I left the room and found myself in the area that you're supposed to find. A giant underground club, which was actually considered its own map on the universe map. The club was of course empty and playing music that was way too loud. The emptiness of the club was similar to how I felt exploring the music rooms. It was an eerily vacant space that will continue to be one until the end of this server's lifespan. Empty and devoid of life is the best way to describe it. I found myself back in the caves after I entered the bathrooms. They had stairs that led back down into the depths. The only difference was these appeared to be new parts of the caves. Here I found these strange rooms. I entered, and it was purely blue. There appeared to be no real reason for its existence. It was somehow more alien than the space station where I started my exploration. Leaving the blue room leads to a red room. It feels similar to the red room of Edgar Allan Poe's A Mask of Red Death. In that story, the red room represented death, but here, it feels ominous for a different reason. Though I'm not sure it served any real purpose, similar to the blue room. Entering the room showed that there was no exit or it should just lead back to the blue room. But when I turned around, the blue room was gone, and instead it was the caves again. Following this was the only jump scare this game ever gave me. As I was walking looking for the exit, I saw someone walk by me going down an opposite hall. I jumped because at this point, I hadn't seen a single other person exploring worlds.com. It was just me, on this lonesome look through a digital ghost town. I quickly realized that it was my character model. Was it a purposeful jump scare that was supposed to make you feel like you weren't actually alone? I couldn't tell, as a copy of me was always moving just before I could catch up to him. I made my way back to the club and found an unmarked door on the second floor. Going through it brought me to an unsuspected place. I was in the hallway of a school, complete with lockers and drinking fountains. This area also had a classroom you could walk into and around and a unique song. Continuing my exploration brought me to a little town area. This all ended with a storefront for a band called Hansen. It was their superstore, but I'm not sure why it was hidden like this, or what the point of the school even was. Before we move on from this world, I wanted to explore outside of the yard, so I found a way to delete part of the wall and I was free to explore. The streets were empty and there's really only one point of interest out here, which is the street light. I continued walking towards the end of the road when this happened. I may have found out what we were supposed to be running from all along. I was attacked by this strange eyeball monster and then teleported to a new part of the map. I walked out of the door and found myself in the attic. When I turned around, the other door was gone. I was just back in the house again. It was a surreal moment in a game that seemed to be filled with them. The exploration of Animal House turned out to be a different experience than I was expecting. The casual hangout spot for college kids had some dark secrets, eerie music, in an atmosphere that would be more at home in a horror movie than a virtual chat room. That's kind of been my entire experience with the game. Aside from a few rumors, I didn't really know much about this game. 
which I suppose it's time to address an elephant in the room. One that plagues the servers of Worlds.com. A rumor that needs a bit of further investigating, that being the supposed cult that resides within the walls of Worlds.com. This cult has been covered by many YouTubers before me. With that said, you can't just explore the game and not discuss one of its most intriguing aspects. I'll be quoting and referencing several sources for this section, and those can be found on screen and in the description of this video. The Cult of Worlds.com was first reported back in 2012. Two names are common in this rumor, those being Jimbly and Nexialist. The two are related in only the game of Worlds.com. They don't overlap beyond that. Starting with Nexialist, he was first mentioned on 4chan around 2012. Unfortunately, the links I pulled from ForgottenWorlds.com, the blog I'm pulling most of this info from, don't work anymore. I can't find any other links or sources either. I was able to find a screenshot that was shown in Nexpo's video on the subject, but I couldn't verify those myself. The posts were from 2013, but the ForgottenWorlds.com blog was from 2012. Nexialis was described as a player that had been around since possibly the late 90s and was a regular on the game. He would approach new players and ask them to follow him. Doing so, he would show them around Worlds.com without really talking. He would then show them the more dark and creepy side of the game usually specifically showing them his world, which had satanic imagery. This all kind of sounds like a creepypasta or urban legend. A person approaches you in a supposedly abandoned game and asks you to follow him. His avatar is this creepy horse thing, which almost looks like a person wearing a hood and mask. This helps with the cult-like image that players and others have bestowed upon him. But that's just the thing. He isn't a cult leader. Not really. Nexialis is a regular in the game. He's using this cult persona to try and bring more people to the game. He specifically was targeting 4chan as a place to bring in new players. Overall, it just sounds like he's a person who wants others to see the creations that he's made and enjoy the game that he does. No harm, no foul, really. Jimbly, on the other hand, is a bit of a different story. There's a small mention to him on the ForgottenWorlds.com blog. This is a place where you'll get most of the information about this guy, as no one else has dug too deep into who he is or what his goal might be. Jimbly had a private network that only those within his inner circle could enter. To do this, he required a picture from you. This seemed weird, but it got weirder. There was a room called the Porn Room that was filled with supposed real images of users that had submitted themselves. There were some of men, but it was mostly of women. Whether these were real people or not, I couldn't know for sure since I wasn't able to see the room myself. According to the blog, there was a room with a user's name that stood out. The other rooms all contained a few or even a single image of a person, so they were labeled with just their room number. One user had their name next to the number, Kelly Cat. This user had a bunch of pictures of her all over the walls, making it seem like someone was stalking her. The images were varied, but a lot of them were indecent. Jimbly had an inner circle, walls filled with images of his followers, and a secret room with indecent images of users. Yeah, he seems like the cult leader here. He's not specifically a cult leader, but of the two, he has more of the traits. No, there really isn't a cult in Worlds.com, no matter how many times this rumor spreads across the internet. It's probably one of the more interesting rumors. It's something that clearly has brought people to the game so they can explore it for themselves. I knew that Worlds.com was supposed to be the original virtual 3D chat room, which is true. What I didn't expect was the dark, lonely, and oftentimes creepy atmosphere of the game. Even the easter eggs hidden within each of the official worlds mostly focused on horror-related finds. These easter eggs, which have no direct answer online, are probably some of the creepiest because of it. They are the exact kind of things I'm looking for on these internet expeditions. Finding a dark side hidden beneath the surface is exactly what I wanted to do when I started this series. Even so, there's still more to see of worlds.com, but I'll save that for later. I still have some websites that we need to explore. Goodbye for now, worlds.com. I will find all of your secrets eventually. The first website I found was something a bit unexpected. First, a little context. In the mid-2000s, there was a movement online that captivated the teens and young adults of the time. It was a vampire movement, one that had people believing that they were in fact vampires. While vampires had always been a rather popular creature, the real reason for the surprising amount of popularity came from a book series and movie that released around that time, Twilight. Twilight and the vampire craze as a whole is a rabbit hole that I was inadvertently stumbling down, and as much as I wanted to see where it led fully, I decided to leave that for my other series. 
but in saying that, I did stumble across an old website worth looking at. This is vampirewebsite.net. It's a site that was created sometime around 2009. In it, the creator starts off by explaining why they are a real vampire. Quote, If you are one of those people that believe that credentials are what determine how much of a real vampire someone is, then fine, here are mine. However, credentials aren't what make a person a real vampire. When it comes to being a vampire, you either are a real vampire or you're not. Actually, after writing this, it seems more like a life story, but trust me, this is only part of my life. At 14 years old, I was developing a strong interest in vampires. I had no thoughts that I might be one, but I always instinctively knew what things in vampire movies were BS and what was in fact real. I got told many times by many people that it was all BS, because real vampires are not real. I always told them that they were wrong, something in me just knew it and knew the truth. Two years later, I started noticing traits that I always thought were the true facts about real vampires starting to develop in me. At this time I was 16. I began working with these traits and trying to make the best of the bad ones and use the good ones to their fullest potential. This included being on the swim team as well as the after school soccer team, while pulling A's and B's in all of my classes, except English and history, because history class was my first class of the day and I was too tired to stay awake due to me always being awake at night. Not to mention at this age, I had started my own coven, technically making me a priest. This is only the start of the life of the story of a man named Stephen. Stephen believed with all his heart that he was a vampire and that real vampires existed in our world. They were not like the movies and books had betrayed them. They were more grounded in reality, but still supernatural or more preternatural. So far it sounds like we have a heavy LARPer with some deep goth tendencies. The usual for the vampire community. He continues his explanation. Jumping to when I was 20 to 21 years old, at this time I was sure that if real vampires existed that I must be one. But for some odd reason, whenever asked, and I was getting asked increasingly more frequently, I never said that I was one with confidence. I only said that if real vampires existed, that I must be one. To give an idea, this is the point where everyone believes in full confidence that they are one. That is in the group called the vampire community. Their delusions are fed by others in that group is falsely convinced that they are real vampires as well, which by my account is 98% of them. At 23, I knew I was a real vampire. I was able to do everything that anyone who referred to themselves as a real vampire could do. I had all the traits. I was able to say yes to all but two of the traits on my website that they had. That included the ones that I could really tell by feel were vampires. Those of you who know what I mean by that feel know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you that don't, I really try to help the best I can with this page. It was great. I was completely developed and I was doing really cool stuff. I was even doing some stuff that people still try to tell me is myth, like biting for blood painlessly. Easy to teach, takes a little practice to get good at, sort of like chess. There's something really important to note here. Well, a few things actually. Firstly, within the online vampire community, there was always a lot of infighting. Every group believed that they were vampires and that other groups were posers or role players. For some reason, each group believed themselves to be the true vampire cult, while the others were fakes. While researching this page, I actually found a lot of other sites that seek to discredit this specific page, which I'll get into once we're done exploring this website. There's still plenty to see. There's a link mentioned in the paragraph, and it takes you to the traits of a vampire. Let's go take a look at those now. The page is titled How to Find a Real Vampire. These all might start to sound a bit odd for those who haven't consumed any vampire media, but if you have, then these will all sound very cliche. These are the traits of a real vampire. There will be a dark colored ring around the iris of their eye. Every vampire has this trait. Not everyone that has this trait is a vampire. There is generally a noticeably different color surrounding the pupil. A real vampire breathing will be slightly shallow at all times except for when they are extremely excited or upset. A real vampire's heart rate usually will match the person's heart rate and speed that is next to them while they are sleeping. They will be able to change your moods and feelings to however they are feeling at the time they are around you. Usually done without the vampire knowing that it's happening. Babies and cats are very sensitive to this effect. Whenever you even glance at them, a real vampire will know that you are looking at them, usually knowing as you're turning your eyes to look at them, even if all you are doing is glancing around the room. This automatically causes them to look right at you at the same exact moment that you were looking at them. You will think that they are staring at you. Usually causes nervousness. Don't be nervous. A real vampire can't help it. 
And if you talk to your friends, they will think that they were being stared at nonstop as well, which you know is impossible. No one can stare at multiple people at the same time, let alone a whole room of people, unless in some cases the vampire is extremely distracted. Their aura will usually have a heavy, thick, dark feel to it. Real vampires, even if they are energy users, don't tend to sense this from other real vampires half as well as normal people do, seeing that they have adjusted to feeling this from themselves. Their aura will have dark clouds of energy in it. Sickness will happen to real vampires usually not as often as it will to normal people. Just they don't stay as sick for as long, and it doesn't really affect them nearly as much. Most real vampires take on aspects of the animal they admire the most. This includes strong mental traits, as well as some subtle physical traits. Whatever type of animal this happens to be will react differently when around a real vampire. General first reaction is awareness, and confusion, curiosity, followed by a sort of mix between how they react to a human and another animal, like them. 99% of the time reacting in a quick friendship. Real vampires will always be able to find a shadow and will prefer to stand in the shadow as opposed to in the sun. Doesn't sound too abnormal until they start finding shadows in the middle of the night and preferring to be in those shadows as well. Also when accidentally banging their hand, elbow, shin, leg, etc. on a hard object, they will always say ouch for show if they think someone saw it happen, to appear normal. When in actuality, they felt no pain at all. They didn't even know it happened minus knowing their body part touched something. Their bedroom will usually be the coldest and darkest room in the house. Electronics that are around a real vampire often such as watches, computers, mp3 players, cell phones, and other electronics tend to malfunction in really weird ways. Real vampires tend to be very charismatic to some while having the complete opposite effect on other people. Real vampires tend to be extremely sensitive in sunlight and other bright lights, resulting in discomfort in most cases and migraine. These are the signs of a real vampire. Unfortunately for them, all of these have sources from fictional media, some dating as far back as Dracula, though some don't have an exact source, so they might have been created within the community itself. As far as inspirations for a lot of these traits, they are pulled from other vampire websites. More or less, these are all decided upon by the community. A lot of them come from Buffy, Twilight, Dracula, and other vampire media. I can't pull exact sources on everything, but if my memory serves, then a lot of these can be traced to some form of vampire media. The list ends by telling you where to find a real vampire. It says that there isn't a specific place where vampires like to hang out, just that to find them you might need to become more nocturnal. He continues the paragraph by stating that having all these traits could be a coincidence, but then uses a quote from Young to point out the improbability of that. At the very bottom of the page is a link to clubs. You are brought to a map of the US and you can click on any of the states to find a vampire friendly club near you. They even include times when they meet as well as the location of the club. I have no idea if people actually meet at these clubs, and I couldn't find a source for it. Clicking on the one closest to me, I found that the clubs had all been closed. Going back to the front page of the website is the explanation for vampires' existence. This is explained that there's a blood-infected VHERV, or retrovirus, that can be spread through blood only. This is how new vampires are created, and also explains the existence of vampires in the first place. They're supposed to be the next evolutionary level for humans as vampires are basically just humans, but better in this world. Linked below are a bunch of studies on retroviruses, but nothing to do with the one that he named, which at the end of the day doesn't really prove anything. It just proves that studies on retroviruses are being done. Further down the page is a section on why the world can't know about vampires, or why the government wouldn't want them to know about them. Fear, hatred, envy, resources, religion, and for the safety of the vampires. Fear the humans will react with hatred and envy leading to vampires being prosecuted like some kind of witch trials. That's kind of all I wanted to look at for this site, as there's a lot of repeating information as well as some really boring exposition dumps. There's a section on vampire slayers, a section on the code that vampires must follow, and a section on how to tell if you're a real vampire. If anyone in the comments finds out if they are, please let me know. This next website is a lot less dark than the prior, but still falls on the stranger side of the internet. This site is called the Tarot of Sneezing, and it is almost exactly what you think it is. It's a website dedicated to the fetish of the sneeze. Now, if you're like me, you didn't know that sneezing was a fetish. Well, I guess anything and everything is a fetish. No matter how weird you think the internet is, you'll always find something that challenges that belief. Let's take a look at the site. The homepage has the Tarot of Sneezing at the top, along with a tissue box and two clickable images. They are the Major Arcana and the Minor Arcana. Going all in on the Tarot theming, if you hover the Major Arcana, the middle image changes. It tells you what you'll find if you check out this link, 
which includes pictures, movie clips, fanfics, songs, comics, beginnings, and more. The other side is male and female stories, as well as sounds. The background of the website is this navy blue that doesn't really work with the vaguely blue text. And it's even worse with the side images with links. On the left side, we have female pictures, male pictures, female movies, and male movies. Moving to the right side, we have male stories, female stories, male sounds, and female sounds. At the center is a note from the site creator, as well as the last time it was updated, and when it was created. Those being 2003 and 1997, respectfully. Now, all of this is strange as it is. We still need to actually click and follow the links. Let's start with the major arcana. There's a lot to unpack here. Starting with the number of links you can click on, which is 22. That is a lot of sneezing media to explore, and definitely shows that six years of work this person did for the site. Let's click the first link, the beginnings. Now, this is rather uncomfortable already. There are links to dozens of kids' media, cartoons, movies, books, and TV shows that have a character being sick or sneezing. This claims that this is where many of the sneezing fetishes actually started. So they started when they were kids. The top quote is something else. Let me read it to you. In many cases, we don't remember what it was that started it. In other cases, we can't forget. This page is dedicated to stories, WAVs, pictures, accounts, concerning people's first introduction to liking sneezing. If you'd like to contribute something, please don't hesitate to. Even a simple story of the first time you can remember seeing someone sneeze or watching one on TV. Such stories bring comfort to many. That comfort can quickly turn to discomfort for others, which is the way a lot of these fetishes work, it seems. Continuing down the site, you can see they included moments from Sesame Street, Frosty the Snowman, and Puff the Magic Dragon. It's a little strange to read the recounting of people who enjoy sneezing, but I like to let people enjoy their, uh, hobbies, as long as it doesn't hurt others. Keeping that in mind, the exploration of the site continues. The next section is fanfic, but I'll be skipping that for the sanity of my viewers. I already read through it, and it's a bit much. Following that is the picture gallery, which has loads of sneezing images that are more comical than arousing. The images are split once again between men and women, and the women have way more pictures. This includes images of actors that would have been popular in the 90s, including the X-Files main duo. There's historical images, edits, and some stock photos. Just a real interesting set of photos. Some of them are gross where you can see the sneeze particles. And well, that's that for the image section. There's a section about guys with colds that makes me cringe, but also laugh. It features men that have colds and need to be taken care of, which might be more of the site's owner's personal interest than anything else. There are photos here as well, just not really sure what there is to look at. That's kind of the whole website. They have sounds for the sneezes as well as movies and where to find people sneezing in them. It's a very complete list that would be insanely large today if they'd kept up with the website. There are so many relics of the old internet here. The existence of this website is kind of all you need to know about the old internet. It was a time and place where anyone could upload anything online and be part of any subgroup they could imagine. Hobbies and interests like this only exist in small niches online and maybe on Reddit. This was definitely a dive into a website that I wasn't expecting to offer so much content to anyone interested in its subject matter. I'm only interested in the historical side of the page though. Its existence is interesting to me, not its content. 